So would you join me, please? Lord, thank you for a day like today, for the, the sounds of gathering, for the space of community, and for the desire to hear from you and, and from your word, the desire to hear from one another, and to see one another, be encouraged by coming back in again from the week and all that that holds. Lord, we come before you as with a sacrifice, a sacrifice of praise, a, a sacrifice of our time to say this is what we want to be doing rather than anything else in the world. So be quick to us, Spirit. Jesus, be our center. And Father, just bring us into communion with you. May you be our only deepest desire. In your name we pray. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Let's uh, stay as we sing the first song, and after that, it's up to you.
the good, the bad, anything we're feeling, He is worthy of it all. And even in the uh, day and night, night and day, let the incense arise. Our worship is incense to God. That's our sacrifice in worship. It talks about day and night, night and day. Let incense arise. As we go about our week here at home, work, school, whatever, I encourage you guys to let your incense arise in worship. And if you don't know what that looks like, you know you don't want to just start breaking out song at work unless the Spirit tells you to. But ask God what type of worship you can do where you are. And He'll let you know so you can't let your incense arise in worship. Let's uh, sing You're Worthy of it, of it All one more time. You're worthy of it all. we've been doing uh, group prayer time and uh, a lot of you have come up to me and just said how much you've enjoyed that space to be able to do that so who am I to take that away <laughs> uh, and it is right and fitting for us to do that and it may not be part of your daily routine uh, to get together and pray with other believers and so we at least uh, on a Sunday morning we we'll provide the opportunity for that hoping that your experience in that would maybe carry into a larger part of your week so with your families or, or, or co-workers or friends. So let's, uh, you know, Carl's going to be taking notes back there for us in case you need to know. Um, but let's, uh, anybody have any prayer or praises to report on from this past week? Dave. Yes, uh, I just want to thank you guys for uh, reaching out for my family and everything. It's uh, been a very rough couple of weeks, to say the least, but... Uh, just continue prayer for both of us for mental health and that we will take care of the kids and everything and financial stability. And... Yeah, you're welcome. You've been on the hearts and minds of all of us, I think, over the last week a lot. So God is definitely working to bring you guys to mind. Other things? Yes, Karen? Um, I just found out this past week that I will be able to retire in May. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my financial plan <laughs> um, he, I mean, I've been going back and forth with this man who's going on from the finance place, but yeah. um, it's been just dragging and dragging. And so I've been praying about it. And uh, I mean, I'm not going to the south of France anytime soon. <laughs> but, but I will have the the money that I need to have what I need, you yeah. know, like I always did. I, I don't, you don't always get what you want, but you get what you need, yeah. like the Rolling Stones. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> and I thought that's wrong. Yeah. You know, like when I, I said, it's like, thank you, God. Yeah. Um, I, don't, I don't have to keep going. So. That's awesome. Thanks. Congrats, Ken. Carl. You pray for me. Well, this is for Eli. I don't know how many of you know Eli. Uh, we Eli here in church. Mm -hmm. But he's going through some personal struggles right now. And he is uh, not with us because of that reason. Not that he doesn't want to come here, but he's away for a little bit. 
So he's asked, he, he calls me periodically, and uh, his personal struggles are he has this feeling, he thought it was neurological, but he's going to everybody, and they say they don't know what it is, so now his fear is it's uh, demonic. So keep Eli in your prayers, and during that whole conversation we had, he ended it with the fact that his mother and father are not sick. However, his mom keeps asking him questions. So he's asking for prayer that he knows the right answers to give her, although he's going through what he's going through. Yeah. And that we keep his mother in prayer as well. Her name is Elsa. Prayers for Eli and his mother Elsa. Um, it's, I'm asking again, I'm still looking for a new job, and it's getting easier and easier to admit that I don't want to be where I am anymore, <laughs> so please, um, I've been asking God so much to just take me away or find me a new job, not ASAP, but that would be preferable, um, <laughs> so just keep praying for that, because I'm ready, very ready. <clears throat> Anybody else? I'd like to just bring up the Ukraine, Ukraine again. Yeah. Um, there's been a request by Meg. Yeah. Could you just reiterate that for us? Okay. Um, there's a ministry up at God's Quest. I mean, we all share the same building called Love's Cradle. And they are getting together uh, a big shipment to go over to Ukraine. They're asking for shoes, clothing, and uh, also um, first aid type okay. supplies. And so if you can bring it next week, uh, I am requesting that all clothes have to be clean and folded. And if you've got a bunch of different clothes, all the same size, put them in a bag, mark them like ladies, extra large, or... Uh, ladies tops extra something like that mm -hmm. so that we can try to sort things down a little bit with shoes um, if they're like sneakers or, or uh, something with a tie tie the two shoes together mm -hmm. otherwise uh, just get some masking tape or something like that and put a couple of wraps around the two shoes so they stay together okay and this is for adults and children sizes adults children's anything that we have they okay. are to Cool. Will they take uh, crutches? That I have not gotten okay. a response on. Okay. I've been praying that the world will come together and help these people. I, mean, I know we're sending money. I got that. But if it doesn't get there, it's not helping. But we're part of that world. Yeah. And I'm sure we all have tons of clothes that we don't wear. Hanging in our closet, getting dusty. So I just pray that the New World Bible Church will do what we can. That's great. Whether it's one pair of shoes or one t-shirt, whatever. And we just remember that we're part of this world and we owe these people some help. Can we put that information in Facebook? Yeah, for I, that? Have a, I have a, uh, like an event. Perfect. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Great. Yeah, there's Britt. A, there's a, um, I don't know how the link ended up on my Facebook page, but there's a group, there's a network of churches in um, Ukraine that I'm following currently, and they're posting just what they're doing. Um, mm. If anybody's interested in supporting specifically um, work that's continuing to go on in, within um, Ukraine, they're um, funded through North Carolina, but there's, I think there's like seven or eight different churches around Kiev, and then in the West and in the South as well. They are they are making up food from the West and sending it into the churches in wow. Kiev to be able to provide for them if they do get locked down. They are. They are visiting people further east. They're, like you can see what God's hands and feet are mm -hmm. doing there. If you want to pray specifically for churches and the ministries that are continuing to go on, I'd be happy to share the, the link with you. Um, awesome. If anybody's interested in seeing <clears throat> Mary. Yeah, one of the one of our workers in Washington, she had during the weekend uh, aneurysm. Mm -hmm. So she will be in the hospital for two weeks. And then we'll know yet what happens for mm -hmm. God's intervention. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. First name? Liz. Liz. Let's just take some time and get into groups of three or four. You're already there and uh, lift these things up as God brings you to your mind. And then I'll interrupt it a little bit.
Lord, we thank you for opportunities to come to you in uh, want and need and benefit and jubilation. Our hearts are heavy, Lord, with the situations of this world and being able to single watch uh, single-handedly and live what's happening, <coughs> oppression and, and malice. And so we, we ask God that you would give us a heart and a mind to understand your will in all of this, to go beyond the will of policy, beyond the will of earthly understanding of this, but we would seek yours above all else. Some things do not make sense to us. Um, human sickness. Why the fairness of that or the unfairness of that? And we go in times of great need and we're your people. It can be hard and it can be confusing. It can be challenging. But we know you are there. You've promised us. That even in times of trouble, and there will be, you have overcome the darkness. And you will be with us to the ends of the earth. We press into that promise, knowing that there are times of trouble, which is also your promise. We grab onto both of them wholeheartedly in an, in an effort to see you through it all the good, the bad, the hard, the easy. Lord, give us eyes to see and ears to hear what you're doing in this world right now. In your name we pray. Amen. I want to just give a quick reminder uh, again for next week. Um, next week, of course, we're having our congregational meeting. And the purpose of a, of a congregational meeting is really to do a couple things. Um, number one is an opportunity to look back and see what it is that God has been doing over the past year here. Um, we can look further back, um, but for the purposes of this meeting, it's generally supposed to be an annual meeting. Maybe something in the future for you will be a little bit more formal, but this is an informal gathering to just really hear about what God has been up to at Willowbury Bible Church and where are we going with certain aspects of our community, certain aspects of the church and new growth and things that are just still going to be on pause until we you know, identify some more support and things like that. Um, it will take place during this service time, so you don't have to come any earlier or stay any longer, although we will be having lunch afterwards, so you're welcome to stick around for lunch. And, and we'll, during lunch, we'll do a little bit of uh, whiteboarding, which is you know, a great time to, to dream and, and a time to say, what's God stirring up in you individually or as families? And how can Willow Grove Bible Church come alongside of that to either enable it or, or to encourage it, confirm it, uh, or, you know, just deny it, I guess. I don't know. I mean, who knows? I haven't seen a lot of denying going on, but a lot of confirming was, is key. In my life, every vision that I jumped after, really assist, uh, confirmation came through as well. Either if it's your spouse or people around you, um, when you jump out into those spaces, you know, having people there in your life to confirm those things, you know, it's, it's really important. Um, before I get into the message this morning, though, I'd like to share a little bit about some personal stuff that's going on in my family, um, because it will directly affect uh, my engagement with this family. The unfortunate conundrum of being a bivocational pastor is that while you single-handedly, with one hand, hold firmly to the church and what you want the church to be about and the role that you've been given to lead there, but you also have this other world that happens uh, Monday through Sunday, all the way through, and you have to hold that firmly too. And, and, and as much as I've read about the theology of work, which there's a lot written out there about the theology of work, which is really, to me, it's always been very uh, 
engaging and it's always been you know, pushed my my faith boundaries and my understanding I've worked with a lot of international workers and and those that are have been given to you know the space where they are to make that space better and to dive in and to be essentially tent makers in those spaces they've always been the most influential outreaches uh, for world evangelization that I've seen um, there are many ways to evangelize this world but for me it's always been with the the labor of my hands and, and the efforts of whatever God has given me in my mind and in my abilities. And so because of that, you know, I've got a lot of opportunities that have always been in front of me. I've been a fortunate person. My, my family, we have been fortunate for the opportunities that we have worked wholeheartedly to assume, but also knowing that God is at the helm of all those things. Work of excellence, no matter what you do, whether you're writing a song or writing a sermon or putting together your Friday weekend report to deliver to your direct report. You know, whatever it is, excellence by God does not have um, loopholes. You can be excellent at things that are churchy and Christian, but not excellent. Don't worry about being excellent in things of the world, you know, and it's not really what we see at all that the Bible talks about. The Bible says, pursue excellence, but not for your glory, right, but for the glory of God, that he may be magnified. I always remember when the John 9, the rich, uh, excuse me, John 9, the, the man born blind, right? Jesus was going to do a work in him. He was going to do something that nobody could do, give this man his sight back. Not so that man would have a better life. Not so that the disciples would finally understand who Jesus is, <laughs> see a miracle in real time. No, so that the glory of God may be on display. And for me, that has meant in my 9 to 5, everything that I do. Whether I say it out loud with my mouth, speaks of the glory of God. The way I treat coworkers, the way I report up, the way I engage just a simple task. I don't think there's much glory in spreadsheets, but I do think that if you do things correctly, you can glorify God with just about any office opportunity that he gives you or, or manual labor opportunity that he gives you. Some are an endurance and some were joyful. Um, I've had a distinct pleasure of working at an amazing organization over the last four and a half years, um, Sowers Incorporated. We are a snow and ice management company. Many of you know that that's kind of what I do. I, I, I push snow from one end of the parking lot to the other end of the parking lot, all around the uh, Philadelphia region. But recently, an opportunity has come to me and to my family that we have spent quite a bit of time engaging and at the end of the day, have decided to move on from Sowers and move into a greater position, a greater opportunity that God has given to us. I'll spare you all the details of what this means for our family, but all I can tell you is that God is good. He has been good to us. This is an opportunity that I didn't see coming, an opportunity that I was not seeking but an opportunity nonetheless that was presented. And through prayer and consideration, we have decided to accept this new role. Some pros and cons about this new role. It's in New York. That's a con for some, unless you're a Yankees fan and it's a pro. Pro is I don't have to move, because I can stay right where I am and I can work from home and remotely and traveling up to New York. We have offices in Hensock and in Virginia and all the way down to Florida. I'll be the chief operating officer for a company known as East End Group out of Long Island. I have jumped from the shallow end of my leadership experience into the very deep end. A challenge that awaits me, excites me, but also frightens me at the same time. It is not a place of safety. <laughs> it is a place of wolves. The general contracting and large firm general contracting and services in the five boroughs area it's not a place that you just trip in lightly to and say, oh, this will be a fun job. You have unions and pushbacks and all kinds of inner workings that I'll now have to learn and try to understand. Admittedly, a couple weeks ago, we met with the leadership team, and I came with my letter of resignation ready to give to them. And we we'll fully intended to say, this has been an amazing year, and... Not that I saw it ending like this for us, but I am so grateful for what God has done in me, and I pray that he has done something in you through our time together. 
The leadership team threw me a curveball that I didn't see coming. That's probably because they're not a corporate organization, but because they're men and, well, this group is all men, men of God that are trying to discern what God might be doing in me and for me. My resignation was submitted at Sowers a week ago. I'm so bonded there. The last two weeks have been so emotionally exhausting and draining. If you've ever left a job that you loved, with people that you love, it's way easier to just be upset at everybody and just not like the job, right? It's easier to just kind of throw a match at it and just be like, I'm out of here. Like, I don't want this anymore, but I love these people that I work for. And the only group of people that I would ever leave them for are named Kalu, Liam, and Josh. And that's what I had to do. I had to move for them. There's been a long history of God moving us around and my, and my wife and the boys being in tow all the time and, and really just kind of searching. I am a person of change. I think that transition into things, the change that accompanies it, is a greater way to see God at work than it is to just kind of get rhythmic and routine. Not everybody is that way, but I am. But this was a change that I knew would benefit, you know, her and the boys. As they start to go to college, those colleges are not cheap. <laughs> and long history of pastoral salaries have not really set me up wisely uh, for this next part of my life. But I'm thankful to God for allowing space where I can still be a part and a participant in helping that. But the leadership team said, Jason... Do you know that this is what God is asking you to do? Which is exactly what they should ask, by the way. And I said, beyond a shadow of a doubt, I know that I need to leave where I'm at working. That I know. But I'm not sure about the church. It's a little fuzzy. Some of that fuzziness comes from the fact that I'm about ready to thrust myself into a ginormous question mark, which will include weeks of travel, in the month of April. I won't be home much of April at all. And I worry. The greatest fear I have in leading this church has always been that I would mail it in on a Sunday morning. That I wouldn't give credit and diligence to the time necessary spent in the Word to be able to deliver something to you that you are hopefully longing into, not to hear what Jason has to think, but that he has discerned what God wants to tell you. And so the greatest hazard in the bivocational, bivocational theory is that sometimes one of the vocations out eclipses the other. And I guarantee in this next six weeks of my life, I will not be in control of my schedule, and nor can I promise that I would be able to give the time to deliver messages that come from faith-filled study and time spent with God. So what the leadership asked, though, was, okay, we get it that you have this new thing. You got a new job. Congratulations. That's amazing. People get new jobs all the time. And that's true. They do. And they don't have to quit other things just because they got a new job, right? This is a little bit more complicated. But at the end of the day, it's really just a new job. And they said, Jason, how do you know you don't just need time to figure out the new thing? I told you I don't have to move, which is nice. So my distance away from the church is as it will be, as it was. And maybe after six weeks' time, I'll understand the lay of the land of what I'm doing and be able to make a more informed and more prayer-filled decision as to what my next step here will be with the church. So that's where we landed. I'm going to take a six-week sabbatical, not paid from the church, take six weeks off to really discern what God would have me do and what role he would have me play here. Fully admit that that's not what I expected to be the answer from the leadership team. Right? My expectation was they're going to want to start searching for somebody else now. And they're going to want to start looking to see who will be their next leader. But what I got back was, if you're still in it and God's still in it, then let's not make a human decision. Let's not make a corporate decision. Instead, let's, let's see what God might be on about. So that's where we're at. It's important that you know, and I could be very transparent with you as to what's going on, because in that same thing with where I left, I will still run into all of those people at, at various events because I'm still going into a like industry, and I don't want there to be funk. 
Mm -hmm. I don't want there to be awkwardness. And the way you do that is you just be honest and you put your yes out there to be yes, right? As Jesus would say. And so that's me doing that to you. I can't promise you that at the end of six weeks, week number seven, I'm back in the saddle and it's as if I never left. I can't. I don't even know what the six weeks in front of me are going to look like. But what I can do and what I have the luxury of doing is asking you to pray for my family and me as we journey this next phase. You can pray that I'll come back. That's fine. <laughs> but more importantly is pray that I see God at work, even in the darkness of the spaces that I'm about ready to jump into. It's not lost on me that as soon as I start talking about praxis and throwing yourself <laughs> in the world into where faith needs it, you know, and all of a sudden this opportunity to work in the heart of the city where nobody is nowhere near, the guys that I've hung out with, I can guarantee you are nowhere near stepping into a space that is faith-filled and communal. Mm -hmm. They commune around other things, mm -hmm. unspeakable things. Mm -hmm. And this is where I'm going to work. If you knew the setup that I had, where I'm at right now, my nine to five, part of you would be like, Jason, I can't believe you would want to leave that. And I don't. But when I start thinking about what God wants and, and, and how will these people in Yafank, Long Island, ever know about God? And are you sending me into there and, 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 and rewarding me for all of my efforts and all of my work, Lord, that, you know, that this is a part of your plan and I'm faithfully pursuing that that is the case? But it's, I'm anxious, really anxious. And as sad as I am to not be around the team at Sowers, it would be equally as sad to not be around you all every Sunday. You have brought a great measure of support, encouragement, not only faithfully and financially, but just you've helped me wrestle through some of the things that I felt that God was done in me or, or was not using me in. And you have showed me that he is. And, and that's all really, when we commune together, we want from each other is for us to see God at work in one another. It's hard to explain to your the company you're leaving that God's at work and that's why you're leaving. Mm. Right? They just say, no, nah, you just took a bigger paycheck. I get it. People do it all the time. But I'll say this to this room, that I think God is at work in this, in me. For what I don't know. But I can tell you that my wife firmly believes it too. And so do my boys. Mm -hmm. Still excited about next week's meeting. Because I believe that some of the things that are happening here, they don't rely on me. They rely on you. And I have seen you grow. I have watched this place grow in understanding not only of Scripture, but of one another. And a deep desire to see God at work at World Growth. I see some retired folks in the room who now have more time than ever to do things for the Lord. I see people giving up portions of their, er, their earthly earnings to enroll into school to study theology and to see what God might be doing in them. I see a growing team here of people that desperately want to smell the aroma of God. And I see families and young people who follow hard after the Lord because of what God is doing in their parents. There's so many opportunities in this space for God to work. And they don't rely on necessarily on the person holding the mic for a half an hour every Sunday morning. That being said, there are three things that I want to share with you that I feel from my time here have really helped me make this decision. One thing that happens in, in, in the world, biblical, not, I mean, you know, secular world, sacred world, smash it all together, is nobody really talks about their process of making decisions, biblically. Right? Like, it's easy just to say we prayed about it, we got a good gut feeling, God's in it. That's easy to do, actually. And people do it all the time, because if that's all you have is a gut feeling and you think, well, it doesn't seem bad, you know, and I, I've asked God, you know. There are three spaces in the Bible that I went to to make this decision that I made. First is in Mark 12, 41. 
This is the passage that Kim always beats me up over. It's the widow's mites. It's the giving out of your poverty. It's the message that I gave here before I ever took the job, thinking I was never going to be offered a job until Kim said, well, you know, you did say that we should give out of our poverty. And if you're poor in time and you don't think you have what it takes, maybe that's something you should give to the Lord. And then that resulted in me working here. So be careful what you preach because, you know, it could be returned in spades. But just real briefly to visit the story again. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many, many rich people threw in large amounts of money, but then a very poor widow came and shuffled up to the front where everybody was dropping the money off and put two very small copper coins into the pile worth only a fraction of a penny. Jesus saw this. He was sitting off to the side with his disciples. Maybe they were relaxing. Maybe they were watching this grand procession. But whatever the case may be, Jesus stopped them and said, Hey, come here, I want you to see this. And they all watched eagerly as this old widow dropped those two pennies in. And this is what Jesus said about that action. I tell you the truth, this poor widow has put more money into the treasury than all the other people. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. And as I've shared in the past, this passage is often preached in an effort to give us this inspiration to give everything we have. Like the poor widow, give everything. Give your whole self over to God. That's not a, that's not a bad sentiment, right? But that's not what Jesus is saying. That's misquoting Jesus, as a matter of fact, if you preach this passage that way. He's not concerned about the amount. He's concerned from where it came. All the other people, Jesus said, they gave out an abundance that they had. Easy to give out of an abundance. <laughs> Easy when things are, 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 are fat and happy to skim off a measure and say, this is yours, Lord. That's easy to do. Harder, impossible to do as she did. Because when you're poor, when you think you don't have enough, that's when you withhold. We've all wrestled with it. The various degrees in our life of giving to the church, of being a part of the church. If I have the time and I have the talents, I will do it. If I don't, uh, I'm going to withhold. If it, if, it, if it makes me feel good when I go, or if I do things the right way and I think that's God at work, I'll do it. But if I don't see anything, and if I don't get those feel goods, I'm withholding. See, when, you, when we live our Christian life like that, we're just skimming off the top, saying that makes me feel good, I'll give to that. But the poverty of our lives, that's where Jesus wants to go. Jesus was poor in sin. He had none. Yet he took it all off. So whether you think that you are blessed or not, those areas where we feel most reluctant, the areas where we feel maybe most selfish, self um, of facing the, the area that we feel we can't measure up, won't measure up, don't have enough to do something. It's too scary of an opportunity. It's, it's lurking out there. Those are the areas that Jesus wants to jump into. So for me, when I think about this opportunity, setting aside finances, the fact that I'm going to thrust myself into this unknown with people that I think like me, but don't know me, in a space where what I faithfully believe in is probably the last thing that anybody there cares about, mm -hmm. seeks, or desires. Mm -hmm. That's not an easy crowd. But I'm up for the challenge. I really am. Because I will give out of the poverty of the space that I can't withdraw from regularly and pray that my, my home team is supporting me through prayer and supplication that I might go out of a poverty of a space where, where it is dim and dark. And who knows how the ministry will happen. It's easy where I'm at right now. It's easy in the space that I am kind of confined in right now. I mean, it's amazing at Sowers, I have like five ex-pastors that work there. It's, it's unbelievable. <laughs> the culture there is so... Faith-filled, it's incredible. New York will be different. 
the next passage that influenced my decision comes in Judges chapter 2. Judges chapter 2 takes up where Joshua, the book of Joshua leaves off, where Joshua has served well at this time. <coughs> and he is getting old about the past, and so what he does is he sends his people away to each of their inheritances that they might live plentiful in the land that they have all earned. Beginning in verse 8 of chapter 2, Joshua, excuse me, verse 6, after Joshua had dismissed the Israelites, they went to take possession of the land, each to his own inheritance. The people served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and of the elders who outlived him, and who had seen all great things the Lord had done for Israel. Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110, and they buried him in the land of his inheritance, at Timnath Harris, in the hill county of Ephraim, north of Mount Gash. After that, whole generation had been gathered up to their fathers. Another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what the Lord had done for Israel. And then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals. They forsook the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of Egypt. They followed and worshipped various gods of the people around them. They provoked the Lord to anger. Not a great story. Not a great story at all, because basically what happened was the story of God stopped. Somehow, some way, it stopped. We know that in ancient Near Eastern culture, the way you put these stories out there for generation after generation was the older generation would bestow the stories and the understanding of God onto the next. And then you would hope that as they grew up, they would tell the stories as well, and then that they would serve God in that space. Joshua and his elders and his leadership did a very good job. And as a result of that, after he left, the rest of that generation grew up serving the Lord. It didn't need Joshua. Joshua wasn't, didn't need to be the guy standing there with the microphone for them to serve the Lord. They had already been doing that. But then the next generation grew up and did not know the things of the Lord. This I use a lot in youth ministry when I would speak at conferences and talk to youth leaders, volunteer and paid, and say, the most important thing you can do is keep telling the story of God to the next generation. Don't stop. Don't stop telling the story. Don't assume that they know it. Don't assume that they're, they're getting it. Keep telling the story. See, when I was young, my parents could rely on like my Sunday school teachers to do that. Right? And they did. The felt graph, the felt boards in my mind are, are always plentiful. <laughs> can tell you almost almost every story verbatim because of great people, a generation of people that embedded those stories within me. That's storytelling. I didn't memorize scripture at that point, but it was enough to get me to pursue the things of God, right? We are all storytellers. And in some way, I feel like I'm being asked to go tell the story in New York. And that sits heavy on me to do that. I don't know what that will look like. I don't know how they want to receive those stories. The majority of it will be told with my life, right? But given the opportunity, maybe a story could be told in a different way too. Whenever I think of a church that complains about a youth group that seems off and wayward, it's not the kids' fault. Kids are kids. I mean, unless you're the O'Donnells, but you're all like <laughs> otherworldly. Kids are kids. People have to keep telling the story. You have to keep telling the story. Finally, John 6. This is the one that put the nail in the coffin for me, for the decision. And to be honest, really affected me when I spoke on this months ago, like deeply. Like almost like, did I not know that? Kind of a feel. So today's message, by the way, is all the things that I need to hear again as I jump into this space. And you're just along for that little ride, I apologize. But this is like a, asking the word of God to pour over me 
for this decision making process. So, John 6, 38 to 40. Jesus says, For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all that he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For, and here it is, my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise him up in that last day. If you want to know what God's will for your life is, I can guarantee you it involves you being a part of helping others see Jesus. It'll happen here as we congregate and we commune together. We'll see Jesus in each other. But there are a lot of people out there that don't have an opportunity to see him. We took three visits up to New York to make this decision. One in New Jersey, two in New York. And when Kalu and I were driving home on that last trip, it was all about the people that we met there, that we were drawn to. Not like, oh, I like that person so much, oh, that person's going to be so hilarious, you know? It was like, we just met these people, and already God's putting like this burden on our mm -hmm. hearts as we're driving away, trying to decide if we want this job or not. We did the whole pros and cons thing that everybody does, right? Pros and cons, pros of taking this job, cons of taking this job, right? And we made our list. But what was undeniable was the burden that is already starting that I'm gonna be quite frank with you, even in the churches that I've worked at before, those burdens don't hit that hard, mm -hmm. that quickly. They do, right? God brings you those spaces, but whatever was going on, the fact that Kalu and I had similar burdens for those people who we, by the way, live three and a half hours from. And somehow we think that we're going to be able to have an influence there. I'm signed up for that. I want to see that happen. I want to watch God do his thing in that space. Because I can't actually, you know, practically tell you how I think that's even possible. So therefore, it's going to have to be one of those things when I look at it and go, oh my God. Only God. See, the will of God is that Ryan, James, John, Jot, these are guys' names that work up there, that they see Jesus and that they will be saved. And if God's using me and my wife and my family and you all through me to do that, then it's the right thing to do. It is. I know that that leaves us in the large chair a little bit, but your leadership team is on it already. They already have figured out who will be speaking over the next six weeks. Larry's going to do a series towards the end of that time. And I think it will be good, very good, for you to hear from them. Uh, and if I can catch you on Facebook, you better, you better believe I will be, to hear what God is saying. <coughs> My encouragement to you leaders as you speak is to speak as those who are responsible with the gravity and the weight of leading us in a continuation of what God's already been at work at, how do we go forward? Mm -hmm. That you would press into the word and that God would speak through you as leaders of the church. I said it last week, but I'll say it again. We have a really great leadership team. And that will be growing, as a matter of fact, because we'll be talking a little bit on next week as to how we're going to add some more people to the leadership team. Non-elder capacity, but coming in as, a, as leaders. So we're excited to talk those things through. I'm very excited about the future of this church. And while I'm sad that for at least the next temporary time I won't be able to physically be here, please know that you will always be on my heart and mind going through this next space. Yeah, why don't you do that? Sure. Sit with Bob. I just, when Jason was talking, I <laughs> thank you. <laughs> that, uh, you know, every time somebody gets a new job, maybe we ought to pray for it as a commissioning. Mm. Yes. And uh, I think that's how we're going to pray for Jason today. And, uh,
Let's do that, Lord. Uh, you know the field out there, and we appreciate the opportunity Jason's had with Sour. And uh, but you know he, we don't want it to be looking into a black pit, Lord. We just want to know that it's something ahead that you are directing and guiding, that he's given thought for and for full attention to, and his family also, Lord, that they come to this decision. And so we mark that in the sand, and we say, Lord, provide for the future, and uh, not only the future of him and work, but the future of him and us. We don't know what it is, Lord, but we know that you are, you are over all things. That's the best thing. Lord, you're coordinating this thing. You're the great leader and the one we need to turn to, and that you have provided miraculously for us in Jason, and, you know, <laughs> in the strangest way possible, but uh, unexpected, but a blessing. And we pray that that would be maybe a thing, that it would be unexpected, the things that happen, but a, but a blessing. We pray for him that the, the testimony that he delivers uh, with his new place, Lord, it may just be an action first, or an attitude, or in the treatment of people, Lord, but we pray that that would blossom and, yeah. and be, him be able to provide truth and joy and hope in a place that's completely the opposite of him. So, and the people he interacts with, Lord, that they would understand uh, that something's different. And they might not understand what it is, but they get a chance to explain it. So we pray a blessing on him. And, you know, hope he comes back. And we hope that uh, he serves you faithfully, Lord. And whatever that turns out to be, we'll you know, say amen. So we thank you for your love and care for him and for us. And uh, help us walk together. And uh, in, in your presence, Lord, in Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. Shall we sing? Yes, Rob. <laughs> Jason, if you need any ties, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> I sure will. <laughs> Yeah. 
Jesus commits my destiny. speak for a couple times here and so that's kind of where it all started and it's grown into something much greater obviously than a pulpit supply <clears throat> especially for me so I just want you all to know I love you very much and uh, whatever God's going to do with this uh, just let's faithfully pursue it together right let's let him be the director of this next phase let's I'll, I'll take off my COO hat and say I won't try to make it manufacture something. I won't predict it. On my end, I'm waiting and watching for him in all of this. And my only request of you is that you would do the same. For me, for my family, for this family, for all of us. So that people in this world will look upon the face of Christ and be saved. I'm really looking forward to next week. And it'll be great to have a meal with you all next week too. So please consider coming, be here for the meeting. And if you know people that should be here and you haven't seen them for a while, it might be a nice time to reach out and say, hey, why don't you come and find out what's going on with the meeting. Cool? All right, let me close this in a word of prayer. Lord, thank you for uh, transition. Um, what can we learn? What can we see in you through change? We know that you will never leave us or forsake us, so we know we don't have to do any of this stuff by ourselves, which is the most comforting thing of all. This church does not have to do anything by themselves. I, my family, we don't have to do anything by ourselves. Because lo, you are Emmanuel, always with us. Bless us, Lord, surely by your presence and your work in our lives. And may we return it to you tenfold and prayers and praises of thanksgiving for what you have done. May your name be praised forever and ever. Amen. See you next week.